everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And I have a great pleasure on behalf of VBE, Values Based Education, in welcoming Richard Dunn. Richard, welcome today. Richard, you're, you're from the Harmony Project and it's terrific to have you here today. I'd like everyone to know that in Herefordshire, we've been working with Richard on a project called Harmony in Herefordshire. And this is a project which is really values in harmony, values and the harmony principles hand in hand. Values and harmony work together so beautifully because in my eyes, values are harmony in action and harmony is values in action. Values underpin, underpin the harmony principles. And I'm sure that you'll see this as Richard is talking to you. You'll also see, because um, it's, it's so palpable, that sustainability is the golden thread that runs throughout this work. And what I've learned from working with Richard is how in understanding our world, better, we come to understand ourselves better. It's absolutely intriguing and joyous both. So I'm so excited to hand over to Richard because I know that you're in for such a treat. Richard, thank you. Thank you, Bridget, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you. And by way of setting the scene, as some of you know, I started out as a head teacher introducing values into the school um, where I was working. And it felt so right as a foundation for the work that we were going to do together as, as a school and to create the language that we were going to use to work by and the relationships that we were going to build together to, to create a community around our learning. So values has, has been such an essential part of my own education. And I thank Neil and, and all of you for that because uh, it's been just such a lovely way to understand how we can work together. And then the work of Harmony has really evolved from that. So um, over time as a head teacher, I could see that the values as Bridget's just been highlighting, the values could grow into something, a curriculum of learning, a way of learning that um, could really help us to see how we could live, um, not just together as a community, but in a better way in relationship to, to the world and to all the, the big sustainability issues that we're so aware of right now with COP um, and the crisis that, that we see around the world. So what I'll share today with you, and I'll just bring up the slides now, is, is something that several of you know already, um, but it's very much um, a framework around which the learning can be developed. So it's a new way of learning and it's inspired by nature. And for me, the beauty of the inspiration of nature is that it's not, uh, it's not exclusive. Anyone from any place in the world can relate to these principles and these messages because they're universal and they're eternal. So building from the values, this, this is the work that has been developed around harmony. And first question is, what does this word harmony mean? It, it's really when, when everything works together, but it has a number of other elements to it. It's about this idea of balance, things working in relationship. It's about things being healthy and whole. It's systemic in its nature and cyclical. Uh, it has that lovely sense of diversity and inclusivity. Um, it's the one and the oneness, the individual and the whole. And what we see in the world uh, and in the natural world are the beautiful outcomes of these systems and dynamic relationship. So harmony is, is about a set of universal laws and principles, and it teaches us how we can live if we want to live sustainably. Nigel and Bridget and I yesterday were having a bit of a chat about, you know, the importance of this work at this time. So here's another little list for you, just sort of drawing out why this approach to learning is so important. And really, it is a philosophy for life. And um, the principles I'll share with you are about a philosophy. And the outcome of those of those principles is a sustainable 
practice or practices. And actually it does help children to learn better because it makes sense. It gives a coherence to what is learned. Um, it gives a different way of looking at learning actually. Um, and it's applied to the real world. So it's about teaching us to learn not just about nature, which we often do, or in nature, which we sometimes do, but to learn from nature and to realize that we are part of that system. Um, and actually, um, we touched on this in our conversation yesterday, it can make a school outstanding because the message of it makes a school stand out just as values do. So this quote, which some of you have seen before is for me really important in this message because if we don't start with our children with these fundamental principles of life, we will go astray. And so many of the issues of the world today are based on a lack of understanding of what the world looks like and how it works when it is in this harmonious state. And of course, alongside that, you have disharmony, discord, but what we see is there's the rebalancing, um, a, a realignment of, of different things that are working together. So it feels like at the moment with so many big challenges ahead of us, we do need a different model. We need a different way of learning. One that is relevant for our young people, has a strong sense of purpose, is interconnected and inspired by nature. So this book, some of you have it, um, is the bringing together of all of that work, the values initially, and then the development of this harmony curriculum. Um, and as it says here in the second paragraph, it's an approach to education that teaches wholeness and relationship, oneness and interdependence. It challenges this idea, which we often see in education, that learning is somehow separate. Whilst we might have skills and knowledge, which are separately taught, ultimately it needs to apply to the one whole. So this first principle of interdependence principle is this idea of interdependence, that everything's connected, everything is working together. And bees are obviously brilliant in helping us to understand how everything in nature does work together. And it helps us to understand systems at work. I've heard this message repeated several times that if we really want to understand how to live in the right way in the world, we have to understand systems even at a young age, how do things work together? So bees are a really good example of us. Uh, we see that in a colony, in a hive, but we also see their relationship to a wider ecosystem. And of course, if we look beyond that, we know that many of our farming systems, which use pesticides and chemicals to control pests, actually do a lot of damage to these important elements within our system. So bees teach us the systemic nature of all life and many other species do too. And they're part of this world of collaboration, pollinating flowers and flowers providing the nectar for the bees. So if we look at learning year on year, one, one half term every year, if we can find a project that helps young people, children to see how the word, the world is based around this word of systems and, and interdependence, then they will learn to see the world in terms of its connections. Just as an example, this is a piece of planning from our back to front planning document, which shows how you can build an inquiry with a question, the principle, the great work outcome, these lovely little hexagon books on bees, and then the different areas of learning feeding in to that project. So it, it's very much back to front. It's not saying teach each subject in its own right. It's saying use those skills and apply them to the project. I think if I had a magic wand around learning, I would, I would wave it for this idea of project-based holistic understanding. Um, and I know that Anne was talking today about the value of, of the whole child and similarly the whole learning for the whole child. So these quotes are, are a lovely way of articulating the language of what this work of harmony means. These quotes coming from children in a primary school. And I'm always fascinated at how profound they are in what they think. And you think, how far could they go if they continued with this understanding? One of the things that's coming out of the work of harmony now is that um, at different stages of education, secondary, 
tertiary and indeed beyond, people are saying, can we use this model to help inform our way of working? So I'm working with a, a secondary school that's going to open next year in the Netherlands, and they want to frame their learning around harmony. Now that will be a, an interesting challenge because it's a different age group, but they want to use the same process and approach. So the second principle is this idea of, of the cycle and cycles and cycles self-limiting, self-regulating. Nature has this amazing ability to self do things. It's not got someone out there telling it what to do, like a teacher. Um, it is its own teacher in its systems. It inherently knows what to do. Uh, that's an amazing thing to think about, isn't it? That uh, everything works through itself. So learning that nature works in cycles teaches us the importance of living within the cycle. It's something we're not doing right now. Um, cycles are models of sustainability because they keep going. And what can we do to reflect and, and, and train our own practices so that they align to this way of, of working. So we see it in a, in a food cycle with a seed to uh, the, the, the joy of harvest time. And just referencing, uh, sorry, the, um, the end of the loop in terms of the food leading into food eating and sharing, and then uh, recycling this food waste back into the soil, not a uh, particularly nice process, uh, but an important one in closing the loop on the cycle. So when we do that, we can then start the cycle again and children see a closed loop system. That's what we have to do with all our practices now in our industries and in our work. How do we create cycles? I mentioned earlier, just before we began, the, um, the, the weekend I just had or the few days I just had in Italy. So this is a scene from the Dolomite Mountains in Italy last weekend. On the left, people digging up turnips. In the middle, the turnips ready to be topped and tailed. And on the right, the uh, shredding of the turnips to then go into a huge vat with salt um, to be fermented and then taken out of the ground, probably in February or March, to give the food, which traditionally people would have done, to give them food in the middle of winter. So what a lovely thing. It's really simple to ferment food, but what a lovely thing for children to engage with in their communities with their allotment growers and so on. Some of you will know this image from doing a conquer competition uh, in autumn, but just as a reminder of the importance of the seasonality of nuts and fruits, that wonderful time of year when we celebrate autumn and harvest. So in terms of projects of learning linked to this idea of cycle, again, year on year, building this message of what does a cycle tell us? Um, it has this lovely sense of, of new life and growth and then abundance and then die back and decay. Um, and that, that period of darkness, of restoration of winter, when things restore themselves and regenerate themselves and then grow again. Great question around our own lives because life works in cycles. So we know that many of our systems are not cyclical and therefore produced huge amounts of waste. And one of the things our children need to know is what can we do to create cycles in all our systems? I heard last month, some of you may have heard too, that in the UK, butterfly numbers continue to fall. This one on the right here, the peacock and the small tortoiseshell on the left, uh, two examples of dramatic decline. And yet when you just look at them in this picture here, you see how beautiful they are. They lift our heart, they lift our spirits, and this diversity in each other and in the world is something we must really protect and look after. So anything that promotes diversity and biodiversity right now with COP telling us how important it is, we heal our world. Um, this is such a great message for our children to know. So a lovely image here of children planting different cherry trees, uh, different varieties of the same uh, fruit, and in the background, different apple trees also in different varieties. Uh, if we look here at uh, carrots growing uh, and the different colors, just get that lovely sense of experiencing taste and textures uh, and looking at different colors, uh, there's such a richness in food, isn't there? 
And then, of course, in us, um, this importance of celebrating diversity in us. Um, one of the things I think we're going to see more and more of is how we value the diversity of our young people in how they learn, in how they grow in different ways. Um, I have a youngest daughter who's autistic and she teaches me every day to see the world in a different way. Uh, and it's fascinating. <laughs> Not always easy sometimes, but fascinating nonetheless. And I think um, there's a lovely quote, isn't there? Um, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes an autistic child to raise the consciousness of the village. What a great quote that is. <laughs> That's from someone who runs uh, an organization supporting autistic children. Um, so diversity is an amazing thing. This is a, a, a fungi or a mushroom um, in, uh, on a farm in Wales. Um, some of you will know of Patrick Holden and his farm. I took this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I just checked before this session, there are 15,000 different varieties of fungi in the UK. 15,000. Isn't that extraordinary? Uh, I think we can, we can celebrate diversity even more than we do. Uh, and it's so important. So I just wanted to show you this. This is a project with the Eden Project in Cornwall, in the west of England. Um, and it's a project on the rainforest. So I've just taken the two middle pages, but there is a front and a back page as well. But you can see here this, this idea of, of a project on rainforest and diversity and biodiversity. And the green shows us that the science is progressing from one week to the next to the next. And the blue shows us that in week three, all the learning is going to join together. It's going to be about a particular three theme, an ecosystem at work. And let's see how we can bring that to life. Um, I get frustrated if people think that we have to learn in silos, in subject silos. I see the value of subject specific skills and knowledge, but I think the best way to learn it is when it has this kind of application. So fourth principle of the six for the six half terms of a year, which is what we have in the UK and maybe in other places too, is this idea of adaptation and evolution. Um, I went to a zoo the other day and um, but another aside, they want to develop a new approach to their zoo based on harmony um, because actually their animals in the zoo are all in separate cages and enclosures. And it, again, reinforces a message that every, everything is separate. But of course, in the real world, in the, in the wild, wild world of nature, things are not separate. This is um, a leopard, as you can see, and it's a, a Sri Lankan leopard. And I didn't realize, but there are nine species of leopard. I thought we generally say leopard, but actually there are nine different types and they're all slightly different. Uh, this one was sadly in a cage um, and right by us, as you can see, we're very close to it. And it was like a, a cat in your home. It was wanting to play endlessly. We stayed with it for about 20 minutes, extraordinary. Um, and just looking at its eyes, these incredible, beautiful eyes. So nature is always adapted to its place and adapting learning to our place to Herefordshire is, uh, as an example, and the work we've been doing there is so important for our children. So we see this world of biomimicry. I'm just starting to work with a, a fascinating professor of biomimicry um, who is wanting to see how he can help children see we have so much to learn from all the different species of plants and animals and fungi and so on that can teach us uh, the most amazing things. So in terms of learning, um, bringing learning to life at this time of year with seasonal soups, um, linking into a Dig for Victory Second World War project, uh, connecting children to their place, their community. We just had Remembrance Day today. Neil's got his poppy on and, um, uh, you know, that really connecting to that and uh, celebrating that with our communities. So we know the value of history um, and the past, um, but we also need to go back, as we said today, back to the future. We need to learn from the past and then we need to take it into the future. Uh, I noticed at COP that Teach the Future, which is a student-based organization, they wanted to present Teach the Teacher. If you look it up, Teach the Future at COP, there's a lovely session of two girls in their teens 
talking about how they want to teach teachers about stuff that they know and their teachers don't know, mainly about climate change and things like that. Um, but they did it beautifully. They were so humble. They talked about dialogue, collaboration, working together. They weren't preachy. They weren't, you know, saying, you don't know this stuff, so we're going to tell you. It was a lovely sense of let's do this together. And I think that's where learning needs to go, doesn't it? That we see that we work together. Our young people have so much to, to tell us and teach us and make us aware of as much as we can tell them things from our own life experiences. So principle of adaptation and these projects that link us one to our place, uh, building a sense of place, but also show us how the world is always adapting and evolving. And it's something we're gonna need to think about more and more in the future, adaptation, mitigation, how are we gonna change the way we live to cope with what's to come? Fifth principle is this idea of health. We all know how important health is and our children need to know what are the things that give them health. And learning about health in its many forms, seeing the connection between the health of our body, the health of our mind, the health of our spirit and our soul and our well-being, they're all connected. They're not somehow separate. So when we have a mental health problem, it's likely to affect us physically. And we see so much of that at the moment, sadly. And it's so central, isn't it, to how we educate now, giving time for an exploration of what well-being means and addressing it when it's not right and helping. I spoke to a head teacher this week. She said a lot of her children are coming into school because their families are very disruptive. Lots of arguments, fights, parents separating, and they're bringing all of that into school. And we know that's really hard if you're trying to learn and you're trying to concentrate on, <laughs> you know, your next grammar exercise or your next maths concept. Um, how do we uh, acknowledge that and value that within the work that we do? So children are very clear about beyond their base needs of, of what they want when they are well, uh, what they want to see happening. They really do want to be valued. The values culture is the number one message behind all of this that they realize their potential, they connect to nature and they have time just to, to be still, that stillness element. And in relation to their world, they have a really clear sense of what their world could be like. And if we had this as a blueprint, blueprint rather, uh, the philosophy that I was talking about earlier, that if we were able to strive for all these different elements, then we would create the most incredible world to live in. And it's there. We know it's there. Um, some of our schools, some of our communities live it out beautifully. So projects of learning that are playful, that are fun, that are connected to the world in which we live, where our food comes from, how we travel. These are all really important things for us to, to explore with our children. And if we had one and a half term a year to do that, mm -hmm. just think of what they would know. And of course, if we took it into secondary as well, we could look at some of the more complex issues around health as they get older. So this is a lovely initiative campaign happening here um, that the Harmony Project is supporting with the Forest School Association and Alliance, a nature premium to ensure all children have regular access to nature-based learning. Uh, places like the University of Derby are doing the most incredible research now telling us how important uh, being in nature is for our well-being, And at this time, it's so essential to how we live. So the final project focus is this principle of oneness, that we're all one in nature, that we are part of this wider world. We have a place in it. And learning how to be still, to know, to find our place in the world brings us this lovely sense of peace to understand the wholeness of life. Uh, I've shared this image probably more than any other image um, and I never tire of seeing it because it just captures this lovely sense of peace and tranquility that comes from these times of stillness. Uh, that picture on the left there, amazing. So projects of learning that give us a sense of this wider world. We can look at great civilizations, religions, indigenous peoples, 
and how they understand the world. I met with an organization who are trying to protect 35 million hectares of rainforest in Ecuador and Colombia. And they have sessions, the, the leaders there, where they wake up in the middle of the night at three o'clock in the morning. They come together in a circle and they wait. And when they're ready, they say what that is coming to them. And they listen to the, the spirits of the forest, to their place, and then they, they articulate what's, being, what's coming through. Uh, and they drink a, t a tea, um, which almost helps with that process. And one of the fascinating things is as they look to move forward, they want to create a forest wisdom university. I thought, gosh, what an amazing thing, a forest wisdom university. So this idea of oneness is, is something we all understand and we need to give time to understanding it. Many of you have practices that tune in very much to that message, being at one with ourselves and with nature. So threading through all of this is this lovely principle of geometry. I saw these berries when I was in Italy last weekend and this beautiful pentagon shape that they have on the end of the berry. It's a tiny berry. Uh, and yet if you get a macro lens and you zoom into it, it has this beautiful shape. Cross section of a carrot, same idea. These incredible patterns and this geometry, this measure of nature that's around us. Uh, the orbit of Earth and Venus around the sun, every Earth year eight years and Venus 13 years, this Fibonacci sequence in the orbit of planets around the sun, something to blow our minds. And it's the same as the tiny flower. And I actually took this flower, this picture of a flower a couple of years ago in the same place that I was last weekend. So it was really nice um, to go back and remember the place where this flower was growing. And of course we see it in the ocean world with starfish as well. So when children learn to draw these geometry patterns and shapes, they really connect to the world and they see it in these beautiful spirals of Fibonacci um, in micro form, in macro form and in our curled up finger. So they realize that there is a connection between us and the wider world. And these geometry sessions are really lovely sessions to do in school and with young people. They develop fine motor skills, concentration, attention to detail and they bring the calmness and the mindfulness we were just talking about. So this is a really great quote. From a systems point of view, the understanding of life begins with the understanding of pattern. I don't know if any of you know Fritch of Capra, but his work on systems thinking is, is absolutely remarkable. So at the end of all of this work, as we know, we have assessments that we need to do, but let's celebrate that work with something great, something that our children will remember that um, punctuates their time in school with these, um, these special moments. They might not be all singing or dancing. They might be something quite simple, sharing a book that they've made with a younger year group, that intergenerational uh, cross year group learning, which we know is so important. So harmony is when everything works together, these different principles coming together. And just to give you a sense of that, this is one year group, we've got six inquiries, we've got six principles, and we've got a message that's taking the harmony principle into a sustainable practice. That's in year one. Same idea in year four, different order. And that's very much about the year group saying, let's create a flow of this for this learning. Let's work out how these principles are gonna work best and let's find the right projects that bring them together. So as the learning is explored, the principles are discussed. What are they telling us? What are they helping us to understand? And what does it mean if we want to live in a sustainable way? So these are fresh off the, off the press uh, because we've just now added today um, sustainable development goals to our projects of learning, our inquiries. So this is one on, on a river cycle and water. Um, so linking, if schools want to, linking sustainable development goals to each of the projects. Here's another one linking to the ancient Egyptians, the principle of oneness, and how they understood this idea of living simply, living within limits, not 
over consuming. Final example here of, uh, sorry, not a final example, but a sense of how these examples work together. So we've got 42 inquiries, seven year groups, six half terms, uh, every one of them drawing out a message with a principle relating to a sustainable practice and a sustainable development goal. So we do need a new paradigm. And my sense is that if we follow these principles of harmony, they will teach us to work systemically, to think in cycles, to value diversity, to focus on the local, on our place, to live well, to see that we are nature, however we understand that, to take time for our inner life and then to take action. It's interesting how the message of COP has been act now. We have no time to lose. And that's absolutely true. We have got to change things. But as so many of you know, we also need to stop and we need to be and we need to listen. And that's what will inform the actions that we need to take. So this lovely quote to conclude, we need to be asking not what sort of planet we are leaving our children, but what sort of children we are leaving our planet. So there we are, um, that's our Harmony website. In fact, you don't even need the Harmony education. We've just updated our website. The Harmony education bit can come off. You just need to do the harmonyproject.org.uk and you'll see more examples of that work. Okay, let me just uh, stop sharing there and come out. Thank you. Richard, that was riveting. <laughs> Thank you so much. Gosh, what a packed half an hour or so you've just given us. And the images that you use are always just so stunning. Um, you've given us a, a half hour of utter beauty. Thank you. <laughs> And Bridget, I was aware that some of you have seen the slides before, so I had to throw in some new ones. <laughs> no, no, they they have a, a, a freshness and a resonance that's enduring, Richard. So, no, please don't apologise. I mean, the, the words, the pictures, the concepts that you just shared with us um, are just, just give a sense of, you know, to be educating children in this way, that sense of opening up the world before us, it's possibilities thinking, as well as all the other thinking that you've been sharing with us. Um, and it leads us through a new path, a new mm. path of possibility. The applications for learning are numerous and the applications for our own lives are equally numerous. Mm. So your, your words, Richard, right now need to be heard by, heard by the whole world. I wish that the world had been on this call today, but the world will get to hear, I'm convinced, and um, be convinced of, of the, the power of what you're saying. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to hand over to anybody who'd like to ask questions of Richard or make comments or talk about things from their perspective. Over to you, Neil. Richard, I, I can't thank you enough for such a, a heartwarming uh, presentation in so many ways. Uh, I thought that was absolutely brilliant the way you put that together. So thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that harmony is uh, one of the central planks of values-based education. We've always said that values-based education is about valuing self, valuing others and valuing the planet. And that all comes together in the exquisite way that you talk about the Harmony Project. Something that you said too that stirred up a memory in my mind. Um, 
perhaps I don't say it often enough now, but for many years I use the phrase, education is a conversation between generations about matters of significance. Mm. When you said that teachers need to learn, that's very true. I was speaking to one of my grandchildren, a grandson uh, the other day, who's at secondary school. And he was looking down at me because he's six foot two. And his father is uh, just about six foot and I'm five foot 10. And it, we were saying how interesting that the generations are getting taller. And he said, Grandpa, he said, there is no one in my class under six foot tall, male. And most of the girls are very tall. If you look statistically, that's happening across. My friend Andrew Fuller in Australia says, as a generality, we now know that the modern generation is in general terms, and I'm generalizing now, more intelligent than my generation. So what are we doing? You know, often uh, adults and teachers are caught in their mindset of specificality of their context, of their environment. And many youngsters I speak to are far more worldly wide. They're far more um, aware than so many adults. And so that conversation I had, the only thing I would take you up on, and I'd like you to tweak one of the slides, <laughs> um, <laughs> forgive me for this. <laughs> And some others may know I've got a thing about this. Uh, I don't personally use the phrase reaching potential. What my neuroscientist friends tell me is human beings have a limitless potential. We cannot reach it. Neurons are continually growing. So we never look to reach a potential because you don't know where that potential is. It is limitless, like the universe is limitless. So no glass ceilings on potential. Again, as I go around the world, I see societies, various groups of people contextualizing and limiting potential through the mores and culture of their particular group. So I do think that we need to just allow you know the infinite and not say as you did when i realize my potential <laughs> you can't realize it so forgive me. just in my defense neil that's a child saying it <laughs> <laughs> so i'll have a i'll find them i think they're find the child <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that, I'll give them a call. <laughs> remember, you know, people only remember a, a critical. Um, I, I do think this is so, and I'm being serious now, this is so vital mm. for the health of the planet, for whether our two, two generations' time survive on this planet. Uh, as Greta said, no more time for blah, blah, blah. We've got to get out and take action. So I hope the Harmony Project really pushes people at an individual level, school level, society into action. Enough of me, I'll be quiet. Now. Thank you, Neil. And, and I think for me, what's exciting is the collaboration that we have, for example, to do that. Mm. Because we know the value of values and we know the value of Harmony. And the more we can work together to really push that message out there, as you do so brilliantly, uh, the better. Yeah, thank you. Nigel? Richard, excellent talk. Very, very interesting, fascinating, just intriguing, just excellent. Could I just ask a practical question? Mm. Um, one of the slides you talked about um, sort of alluded to it but it's the, this is the question schools at the moment are inundated with work and demands mm. how do they manage an additional curriculum over and above what they're already doing when they're struggling to cope with their current curriculum what do you visualize the harmony projects um, addressing in order that they can accommodate it within their existing workload rather than creating additional stresses, which they just don't have the time uh, or, or the resources to manage. 
Yeah, it's a really, a really important question. Otherwise, it does feel rather alternative and 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 out there. It doesn't feel mainstream enough. And of course, we know we need to make it work within the systems of education that are all around the world. Um, I think it's it isn't about it being a different curriculum. It's about it being the same curriculum, but just seen and understood in a different way. Um, so you're rethinking, reimagining, reworking that curriculum. And I would go the other way and say, I think it's quite easy to do. I think we just need to understand what we need to do, which is where there's the support and the training and the, the guidance comes in. Um, but I think once people get it, they can then apply it relatively easily. So you can still teach your same science curriculum. You can still do your same geography and history learning, but you you work on it and you, you teach it and then ultimately learn it uh, in a different way. So I think actually a lot of what we're doing now and if the call I was on just before this was with a school that I'm going to see on Monday, where it's absolutely about that. We're gonna take next half terms learning. We're gonna sit down in year groups and we're gonna work out the journey um, and the outcome of that journey, the great work, um, but using the material that they've already got. We're not bringing a, additional stuff in. Um, as many of you know, we have, to be, we have to be realistic about the demands. So, you know, math schemes of work still tick over in schools and probably four days of a week in a school, they'll be doing that sort of thing. Um, but maybe on the fifth day, there's an opportunity to apply that maths to the project of learning or the inquiry um, and, and bring it to life. I think, you know, what I'm concerned about, my daughter's learning about perimeter and measure. And to me, she needs to be doing that in a practical way. She needs to be outside measuring things, estimating things, measuring things. She doesn't need to be filling in forms all the time might be helpful for some part of that learning um so yeah so i think i think we need to which is i suppose what those resources are about nigel is to help people see what can be done and people can look at the overviews or the medium term plans and go okay i can see where our history learning is there where our science learning is there i think the final point is that there's not a huge amount in the curriculum there's a lot of core learning stuff but the other areas um I think there's scope to make it your own. And one of the things we've talked about is making it our own and giving our school and our children's learning an identity so that it makes sense to them. I've got to come in there to remind us that uh, of the danger of being English education centric. Um, having become more aware of the Welsh uh, development, uh, which Mick Waters and others have been doing. Um, you know, England is getting further and further behind the times as far as the world's ed education is concerned. I've learned that through working with my colleagues on the V20. And uh, so there's great hope in many countries where, where they're much more holistic. If you go to Scandinavian countries, for instance, they're much more talking about the sort of things you are, uh, Richard, than in England. And I think sometimes the Harmony Project, I think needs to work with other countries uh, to show some really great models. And I know you're doing that with mm. your case in Holland and, and Italy and all sorts of places. So, you know, I am, optimistic about curriculum development. Um, are you aware, uh, something that's been made more and more aware to me is uh, an organization called the Foundation for Educational Development. It's, um, I've been asked to be one of its ambassadors. And, um, you know, I was, I was amazed when I was asked this week if I would be, and they've been beavering uh, uh, about this. Uh, the, the Duke of Edinburgh was a great supporter in the early days of this organization. And uh, it, its whole uh, modus operandi is to look about what the future of education should look like in the United Kingdom. And they've written a futures document on, on that. 
and I'm just hoping I have I need to go back to the document, but you look it up, Richard, and see if if there's enough on harmony. And if there's not, let me know, and I'll I'll have a word with the powers that are uh, to make sure we we get this in. Because if we're looking to the future of education, you know, I'm quite a revolutionary at the moment about what it should be, and uh, I want to see you there too. So, yeah, uh, have a look on their website. I will. Yeah, yeah, that's great to know, Neil. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Nigel's back in. <laughs> if anybody else wants to come in, please do so. Um, but because we haven't got that much longer. Um, and don't forget, there's the chat box if anybody wants to make a point, um, if they want to say something. But um, Richard, just I've got one final question, which is you spent quite a long time teaching this curriculum. So very extensively, partly when you developed it, you've also been involved with a lot of schools that have implemented it and you're supporting them. I just wonder what your experience is of the impact it has on the children, on their character, on their ability to learn, on the staff and on the school itself. So the question I'm asking is, in a practical sense, how do people react and how do they, what impact does it have when they engage in this, what I think is an incredible harmony curriculum? Well, we've got some good examples here. <laughs> I'm just wondering whether Anne or, or Bridget would like to say anything. I mean, I'll just to preface that. I think it, people get very excited by it. I think people really love it because it it just works for them. I mean, I, I was talking this morning with Lisa, who is one of the people in our team, and she went to an infant school that has developed a really lovely harmony curriculum and made it their own, absolutely made it their own. It's not a prescribed thing. And, um, you know, they're, they're actually desperate to share it. They want to get on a webinar and, you know, put some slides up and tell people how brilliant their work is. So they've really owned it and they've really taken it on board and made it work for their children and their, and their school. I think my sense overall is, as we know, you know, when children love learning and are excited by learning and engaged in their learning, then the outcomes will be good. And, um, and we need that so much right now. We need our children to be joyful in their learning. Um, and yeah, there's a hard work element to it too. Um, but they don't, they're not separate. They can go hand in hand. Any, any comments from Anne, Bridget? I was going to be very quiet tonight. <laughs> I just think it's it's about it not being a stress, but being part of. I think that's really important. And I think the way you can make it not a stress and part of is treading softly and carefully, but with real enthusiasm uh, and actually seeing what it brings to children and staff. And it, it, it is a time, it's a new curriculum era for us, isn't it? The, the um, curriculum is is much more open, as you've already said, and, and there is, to a certain, up to a, a, a large degree, opportunities for us to make it our own. Um, and I just think values and harmony. Um, so there is no question that that is what we should be making our own for our staff, our own for our school, and, and most importantly, our own for for children and communities. And 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 I think you just do what what we've started to do is look at almost our practice as it was and just start to incorporate it and start to bring it in. And then when you start to bring it in, the balance starts to shift. So you begin to see more of the harmony curriculum or values um, and less of. But I think it's just about allowing that balance to happen and not, not suddenly waiting it because then, you know, the well-being of staff and the goodwill of staff and, and all of that, which is so important, particularly at the moment, is just, just goes... So it's just about having that beautiful balance. That's oneness that <laughs> all the things that we've talked about, health, it's about adapting, but keeping hold of all of the things that, you know, all of those values that are so important as well, that, that just go, go hand in hand with it. Um, and I will just give one lovely example, which a, a few, you know, a couple of people have already heard me say, is that, you know, we had a pupil progress meeting and we we're talking about progress and, you know, the own track is all reading, writing, maths, and we, ha we have to have it. 
we, we can't, unfortunately. I know I need to look at Neil and go, we don't have to have it, but we have to have it to a certain extent or else, you know, that makes life very difficult for leaders and schools. But alongside that, you know, one of the really lovely conversations I had about was about when we were talking about writing, that actually some beautiful pieces of writing had come from what, what would be classified as maybe our children that were finding writing a little bit tricky. RE had really inspired them. And within RE, and um, within that, what Richard put about finding a place in a piece, that, that came in. So we're bringing one of us in, and then we can actually say to the children, eventually, because we're right at the start of, of working through this. So, you know, whereas they know the values, they know those words, they kind of can see them, they can, they can explain them. Um, we're not quite there with the harmony words yet, but you can then say, do you know, that's kind of oneness. That's what the principle of oneness is. That's the harmony principle of oneness. And I think once your whole school is talking that language, like we talk the language of values, once we start talking about the, the language of harmony and, and bring in that huge sustain, sustainable thing, which, you know, it, it's there, it has to be. I just feel that, that that is a kind of way that we can do it. So it's just getting that balance right at the right time. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for those lovely words. And to, just to add to yours um, and to say something just really, really simple, which is that the children really love it. They, they really get it. You know, just like they get values, they get harmony. Um, so that says so much, doesn't it? Richard, on behalf of everybody here tonight, I'd like to thank you exceedingly for giving your time, your expertise, your passion and your energies to our session today. Um, and it's really great to be working with you. So thank, thank you, so you much. very much indeed. My pleasure to be here. I so enjoy working with you and Anne ongoing and Neil and Nigel and and Sue as well, and and lovely to meet the new faces on the uh, on the Zoom call today. So, yeah, looking forward to continuing our journey together. And great to be with you. Thank you so much.